We're going to go on from verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it goes like this. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Godless chatter. If you notice that uh, in the last sentence, the last verse, or second last verse of the first letter of Timothy also, to Timothy, uh, Paul wrote, it's in First Timothy 6 chapter, 2021, turn away from godless chatter. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, where some have professed and have wandered away from the faith. Even the first letter followed over the same thing. Avoid godless chatter. And as I told you last time, there was a time gap between the first letter and second letter. First letter he wrote when he was outside prison and uh, again got arrested again, second time. And this letter was written from the prison. How long was the time gap, we don't know. But the fact is that even now, they were indulging in godless chatter. The church in Ephesus where uh, Timothy was the elder. And the word chatter used here is in the Greek, the word is kenophonia. Kenophonia. Kenophonia is K E N O P H O N I A, kenophonia. It means fruitless discussion, as a meaning of chatter, godless chatter, fruitless discussion. Now, we all know that in the churches, even today, when we meet together on a Sunday morning, after the church service, when people go down to the basement of church for what they call coffee fellowship, if you notice the conversation around the coffee uh, table or whatever, usually it is ungodly. In the church, everybody is quiet, listening to the message. Once you go down and have fellowship, you talk of everything else except about what God spoke that day. See, in a worship service, we minister to God through prayer and worship ministering to God. And God ministers to us through his word. That's how it should be. Praise and worship is to God. Word of God is from God. So ideally, after the church service, when we meet together, we should have fellowship centered on Christ. Christ-centered conversation. That's how it should be. But usually, in many churches, they indulge in godless chatter, fruitless discussion. And Paul says, those indulgence will become more and more ungodly. So we have to talk about what God spoke that day, what God did that day, what is doing in your life. And the whole conversation must be Christ-centered conversation. So again, Paul writes to Timothy and says, avoid godless chatter. Because those indulgence become more and more ungodly. Verse 17, their teaching was spread like gangrene. Among them are Hemenius and Filters who wandered away from the faith. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. They destroy the faith of some. Among the people who indulge in godless chatter, uh, these two names mentioned, uh, Hymenes and Philectus, the teaching spreads like gangrene. Gangrene means it slowly spreads, but spreads continuously. It affects the whole uh, the part of the body, especially the legs, gangrene. So he said that teaching spreads like that. And they are actually, he says, they have wandered away from the faith. They say resurrection already takes place and they destroy the faith of some. The word destroy, very careful with that word. The Greek word for use here is actually anatrepo. A-N-A-T-R-P-O. Anatrepo. Anatrepo actually means they submerge the faith of others. They pull down the faith of others, not completely destroy. Another part doesn't mean destroy completely. It means they subverge their faith and they, uh, in fact, the word that says upset their faith, upset. Another part means to upset. Some Bibles actually say upset their faith, not destroy their faith. So we have to understand that these people, Hymenes and Philetus, they were people who wandered from the faith and giving false teaching, religion already taking place. And uh, people are following them. And people like new teaching. Generally speaking, when something new comes up, people get attracted. And oh, this is something very new. I learned something wonderful. Deep secret I've learned. And uh, the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake can puff us up. And here their faith was upset. 
faith was submerged, not destroyed completely. Anatrapo means to submerge their faith and to pull down their faith. That's what these people did to some people in the, in the body of Christ in Ephesus. Then look at verse 19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So very beautiful two verses. Two, two points. Now, we have to go back to the point of time when a person is saved. This is what that reference to people who are saved and the point of time when they were saved, what happened when they got saved, what they did to get saved, that's found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. The Paul writes, Romans 10 and 10, if you confess the mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, he rose from the dead, you are saved. For it's your heart you believe and are justified, with the mouth you confess and you are saved. We believe in our heart and we justify it. We confess the mouth and we are saved. So two things. One is to believe in the heart. He rose from the dead. Because that means when we believe in that, we believe that we also rise from the dead. It requires faith to believe that. When he rose from the dead. Died for our sins. Put in a tomb. Rose again on the third day. Giving us hope that we also rise from the dead. So, Romans 10, 9 and 10 talks about at what point of time and how people are saved. When we believe in our heart, he rose from the dead and confess the mouth, he is Lord, we are saved. With the heart, you believe in the justified, the mouth, you confess, acknowledge, and you are saved. Now, let's compare that with this. The foundation of the church, you know, foundation means the basis of the church. In, in many ways, the, the church, the body of Christ is compared to a building, to a building. Every building has a foundation. And if you look at uh, 1 Peter, chapter 2, from verse 4, we read, 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 4 onwards, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built in the spiritual house. To the holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Christ. A spiritual house will be built into, but Christ is the cornerstone. So the, actually, the, it's talking about, talking about a building, the church being a building, comparing to the building. Every building has a foundation. And the foundation of the body of Christ is all those people who believe in a heart that Christ rose from the dead and confess the mouth, he is Lord. Now here it says, the Lord knows those who are his. The foreign stands from the inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. Meaning, the Lord knows who are the people who believe in the heart they rose from the dead. Many people say many things. But then whether they believe in the heart or not, only God knows. The Lord knows those who are his. The Lord sees the heart of people. When he believe in the heart he rose from the dead, we are justified. And the Lord knows those of us, those who are his. And then it says, everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must depart from iniquity, or depart from sin. So these two verses, actually verse uh, 19, 19 was actually, 19 was allowed, two points mentioned there. Number one, Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. That's the foundation of the church, of the body of Christ. So, we believe, God knows, whether believe or not in your heart. And if you say he's Lord, then the expression of that declaration is you must turn from sin. Because after he saved us, he's called us to a holy life. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says, Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, he saved us and called us to a holy life. Saved us and called us to a holy life. So once he is saved, first comes salvation, then comes your holy life. Like we, wrote, we read about uh, Titus, I was, I was referring to Titus when I spoke on First Timothy. 
in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul writes to Titus and says, the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. After receiving salvation, we live a godly life, not the other way around. We don't put the cart before the horse. We are saved and called to holy life. Knowing the truth leads to godliness. We can't expect people to be godly without knowing the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is our, is our truth for the whole world. He is the truth. When you know the truth, that's a starting point of being godly. He saved us and called us holy life. So when you believe and heart, he rose from the dead. We are justified. And the Lord knows those who are his. And everybody says Jesus is the Lord, is saved. But then if you say he's Lord, subsequently, you're called to live a life set apart for Jesus. God will not take away our salvation. But we lose the joy of salvation, the peace of salvation, when we don't live for him. Okay, let me go on. Verse 20. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also wood and stone. Some are for noble purposes, some for ignoble purposes. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, latter meaning ignoble act deeds from wickedness, he be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful for the master, and prepared to do any good work. In a large house, take a physical house. In a large house, there are articles of gold and silver, wood and stone. Some for noble purposes, some for ignoble purposes. Take a practical example. In a house, there are vessels in the kitchen, there are vessels in the drawing room, there are vessels in the bathroom. Will you use a bathroom vessel in the kitchen? You will not. Will you use a kitchen vessel in the bathroom? No. Will you use a kitchen vessel in the drawing room? No. Drawing room vessels are basically for show, kitchen for utility, and bathroom for other purposes. We know that. So each vessel has got a particular purpose. Some for noble purposes, some for ignoble purposes. Similarly, in the house of God, God has got people in his house. They're all in his house. We are all saved. But everybody doesn't live for Jesus. God loves everybody. But everybody doesn't love God equally. And God uses people to be an example to others. Sometimes good examples, sometimes bad examples. Noble purposes, some ignoble purposes. Now, in the Bible, you'll notice that everybody in the past, God's people, who is wonderfully by God, their sins are not concealed. Their sins are not exposed. Only the Lord Jesus Christ was sinless in the Bible, no, in, the, in the history of this world. Only he was sinless. Everybody else had their own weaknesses. And the Bible actually is very transparent about the sins of God's people in the Bible. And we will do well to emulate the good things they did and avoid the wrong things they did. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4, for everything written in the past was written to teach us. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we will have a hope. Whatever is in the past written is for our education, for us to learn. There are examples of noble people in the Bible whom we have to follow. And the examples of people who disobeyed God. Don't follow that. Even the contemporary world today, Christian world, there are examples to follow, examples not to follow. We don't condemn people who have fallen from grace. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 4, Romans 14, 4, who will reject someone else's servant? To his own master, he will stand or fall. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. Many examples in the Bible of people who grumbled against God. Even Jeremiah grumbled against God. But God commended Jeremiah for his faith in sharing God's word. We don't follow them in the wrong things they did. We follow them in the good things they did. And therefore, when we look at the scriptures and learn from people in the Bible, what we should do, what we should not do, we become better instruments in God's hands. Let's go back. Some for noble purposes, 
some ignoble purpose. Then it says, if a man cleanses himself from the latter, latter means wickedness, ignoble deeds, keep an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. When you turn from wickedness, we will have confidence, we'll have confidence of God using us. God uses anybody who's available. But then when you depart from iniquity, we not only have an effective ministry, we'll have the joy of ministry. We'll enjoy the ministry. God uses anybody. He is sovereign God. The whole earth is in hands. Everybody in the world is in God's hands. Anybody he can use. But the person being used by God when it departs from iniquity, from ignoble purposes, he be a instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So the fundamental question is, are we just having a ministry or are we having the joy of ministry? We can't have the joy of ministry if we're doing ministry with the wrong purposes, wrong motivation, and with hidden agendas. And when we have sin in our lives, we can enjoy a close personal walk with God. But this does not mean that if, unless you're perfect, you can't be used by God. God uses sinners. We're all sinners. None of us can say we don't sin. But then as when sin creeps in, you throw the sin away, we're better instrument in God's hands. Made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So, the foundation of the church is those who believe in our heart who rose from the dead and compare the mouth Jesus Christ Lord. Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who says Jesus is Lord should depart from iniquity. And fundamental question is, are we in the house of God as a vessel for noble purposes or a vessel for ignoble purposes? Does God make us a display of a splendor to other people in the church as an example to follow for example, not to follow. That question only we can answer before God. And of course, if you feel you are not right before God, get right with God. He's always willing to restore us to a close walk with Him. Let's go on from here. Verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord or the pure heart. Again, you go back to in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, in the context of love of money, Paul tells Timothy, flee all these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. 1 Timothy 6, 11. Same sentiments mentioned here. Earlier it was, flee from love of money. Here, what does it say? Flee from evil desires of youth. Flee means run away. Run away from all those things. Pursue righteousness. Righteousness actually mean, means justification. Seek to be justified by God. But God will justify you before people. Here's my son whom I love. Here's my son I'm pleased with. This is justification, not justification to go to heaven. This justification is God justifying us before people as an example to follow. So here he says, seek that justification, seek the righteousness, be right with God, that God will rem rem remind people to follow you because your example is example to follow. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. There's no limit to faith, no limit to love, no limit to manifesting the peace of God. So in telling Timothy, Timothy, there are many people who love money, there are many people who pursue all this wickedness. You flee from that, run away from that. And pursue, run away from those things and run behind the righteousness of God, the faith he gives us, the love he gives us, and the peace he gives us. That's an instruction to Timothy to follow as an example. Okay. Almost 23 onwards. I'm going to read from 23 to 26 and discuss the whole, whole uh, four verses. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, 
humankind to everyone able to teach not to sent those who oppose him he was gently instruct in the hope god grant them repentance lead them to know the truth that they come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will a very beautiful passage very simple practical instruction don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments and the lord servant must not quarrel what an awesome statement simple statement yet it is to be followed not just theoretical knowledge academic knowledge we have to obey we are all god servants every believer is a servant of god is called to be a servant of god when he say lord i want to serve you lord which means we must not quarrel those who oppose him he must gently instruct there are people who oppose us we could be believers who oppose us for doctrine sake it could be people of other faiths who oppose us because we share the gospel we all face opposition in the world because god's ways and world's ways are different god's thoughts and world's thoughts are different we are a minority in the world in terms of you as human being but god is on our side so we are a majority so don't worry about that but the inter- instruction of god is the lord servant must not quarrel he may be kind to everyone able to teach not to send those who oppose him he must gently instruct now it takes two people to quarrel you can't quarrel with the wall you can't quarrel with the door or a window you quarrel with people it takes two people to quarrel and very often we find people provoking us irritating us to pick up a quarrel and behind them is the devil look at this passage it says these people are not in the senses they are in the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will so when you are sharing god's word in the love of god in the right way and people oppose you for the truth that you are speaking then behind the person opposing you is a spirit these people are under the control of the evil one and paul says you gently instruct in the hope or grant them repentance leading them to know the truth they come to the senses many they not in the senses when they fight with they not in the senses they are in the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will so we understand it's a spiritual warfare when you speak the truth then love and people oppose you they are under devil's control we don't tell them that we should know that and don't argue with them lord seven must not quarrel be kind to everyone able to teach not resentful but gently instruct and for that we need wisdom wisdom will teach us to be patient wisdom will teach us to be humble and now what happens when people oppose us no it hurts our ego our ego is provoked and we react the answer for impatience and pride is actually wisdom wisdom if you find that you are not able to control an argument they start start to fight with you and you get into an argument and quarrel please ask god for wisdom wisdom will teach us patience proverbs 9:11 says Problem nine eleven, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is going to overlook an offense. When people offend you, overlook it. A man's wisdom gives him patience. Also, humility comes from wisdom. James three thirteen, humility comes from wisdom. When our pride is being provoked by the devil through somebody who opposes us, pride gets provoked. Don't react. Ecclesiastes seven chapter eight and nine. Ecclesiastes seven chapter eight and nine. The end of the matter is better than the beginning, and patience is better than pride. Don't be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. It's a very important passage. This is very practical, and so often we say, "Oh, I he got he provoked me. I got into quarrel." We should not quarrel. Simple. 
There are God's servants called it is taboo for us. Remember the other person under devil's control. You start quarreling, you get angry. What's happening? They are giving the devil a foothold. Ephesians 4 chapter 26, 27. Ephesians 4, 26, 27, you didn't. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Here you are, sharing God's word, speaking, calling God's word. Other person is provoking you, irritating you. You get provoked, you get angry. What's happening? You're giving the devil a foothold. The other person, the ordinary devil's control, in the trap of the devil, who has taken captive to do his will, devil's will. They're provoking you. You get angry. You are giving devil a foothold. So what's the devil doing? He's playing puppet show. Puppet show. Other man, audience devil's control. You are giving yourself to the devil, giving a foothold. He's playing puppet show. Putting both of us together, fighting, having a, having a ball. Remember, at that point of time, ask God for wisdom, patience and humility. Gently instruct and leave it to God to justify that you are right. God will justify. He'll vindicate you. Don't have to fight for our causes. Only thing, make sure we're speaking the truth, speaking in love. It's a very important instruction to Timothy. Timothy was a leader there, the Lord of quarreling among the church members. I told you about how from Pergamum, Pergamum was the seat of uh, throne of Satan. If you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about the Pergamum, the church in Pergamum. But Satan has a throne. A lot of false teaching came from there. From Pergamum, from Thyatira, all the same area. Ephesus, Thyatira, Pergamum, seven churches of Revelation, all the same area. A lot of false teaching came. And when there's false teaching, there'll be discussions, arguments, quarreling about words. And God called the Timothy, you don't quarrel. Avoid godless chatter or uh, fruitless discussion. Because then they will become more and more ungodly. And the pursuit of so-called knowledge, they wander away from the faith. This passage is a very beautiful passage. If all of, if all of us simply follow this passage and ask God, give me wisdom, Lord. Give me your love, Lord. And with the wisdom and love, I'll be patient. I won't be proud. Then you can avoid quarrels. And when people begin to quarrel, simply put into the conversation. Tell them, see, I told you what I have to tell you. You ask God, whether I am right or you are right. Let's not fight about it. For mature people, don't fight about doctrines. Philippians 3rd chapter, 14, 15, 16. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. If on some point you think differently, God will make clear to you. Please remember, the Holy Spirit is a vindicator. God is a vindicator for you. He'll vindicate your, your stand. Don't have to fight for our own point of view. He'll vindicate us. Some 135 verse 14. Some 135 verse 14. God will vindicate his people. Very simple passage this is. 24 to 26. And a lot of meaning, a lot of practical instruction. We'll do well to follow it. And quarreling is not for a Christian. For a servant of God. And of course, we all say, oh, everybody quarrels. But we're not everybody. We are strangers in the world. We're not like others. And God bless us. We will practically apply this in our lives and don't quarrel with people, believer or unbeliever, but rather speak the truth in love and wait for God to vindicate you when you are right and point out your mistake when you are wrong.